This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome into another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. It's Bill Bartholomew here with you for new episodes every Tuesday and Friday, wherever you're listening right now, or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and, of course, ripodcast.com. Today, we welcome my colleague over at Rhode Island PBS Weekly, the one, the only Michelle San Miguel. And this was a fun conversation about the brand spanking new news magazine program that we are airing every Wednesday night on Rhode Island PBS television. You've probably heard me talk about the TV show since, I don't know, like last July here on the pod. And this is a lot of fun. This is a brand new thing for Rhode Island, long form television journalism. Think like 60 Minutes, Dateline NBC, Vice News, that kind of style. And it's Michelle San Miguel, formerly of Channel 10. She anchors the show and myself as the uh, the principal reporters on the program. And look, you know, we can go into stories in a way that TV news at 6 o'clock just can't. From a time limitation perspective, we have a 30-minute slot. We usually do two big stories with a couple of features tagged on to the end of it. You know, some of my projects have been looking at the Jamal Gonzalez situation, um, tracing Rhode Island's ties to slavery, Airbnb taking over downtown Newport, right? You know, these are the pieces that I've been hyping and putting on social media. They're a part of this show that airs on television again every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Or you can watch them on demand at ripbs.org slash weekly. So Michelle and I get into everything about this show, you know, journalism in this moment right now of COVID-19, social justice action, and so much more. And it's a fascinating conversation, and I think you'll really enjoy it. We get into her backstory, where she came from, how she made her way to Rhode Island in the first place, and why she's staying here. And we also get into our um, the opportunity that we had to work alongside the the great, the Hall of Fame level broadcaster, Bill Rapoli, who, as many of you know, passed away earlier this year after a battle with cancer. And he was an original cast member of Rhode Island PBS Weekly, and frankly, um, an amazing mentor to many, many young journalists out there and broadcasters out there, but specifically Michelle and I, and uh, so we get to touch on that as well. Sad as it is, important to honor the legacy of the fedora-wearing legend that Bill Rapoli will always be. By the way, if you want to support the independent journalism, opinion, analysis, and entertainment that B-Town has become known for here, almost 300 episodes, look out, holy Moses, Holy Toledo, I heard someone say that the other day. I was like, i got to bring back Holy Toledo on a regular basis. Well, there's a few ways you can do so. Certainly share this episode on social media. Tell someone about the program. You can leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts right now. That goes a long way to helping us kind of reach more people organically, which, by the way, that's the way that this program has gotten out there. I'm not spending money on ads and all that nonsense. You know, we're not spamming people with, with emails or any of that garbage. It's all word of mouth, and all of you out there have driven this show to the point where it's now listened to on a regular basis by a ton of people in Rhode Island and beyond. And what's actually been really cool is to see when the numbers come in, we have obviously a huge audience here in Rhode Island, but we also have a large audience in Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., places where a lot of Rhode Islanders go. <laughs> there are a lot of Rhode Islanders who are working in politics or otherwise go. So you spreading the word, keeping the pedal down, that is the number one thing that you can do. If you want to take it a step further, you may become a B-Town insider. You'll receive exclusive monthly content and help to sustain this program. Simply head to patreon.com slash Bartholomew Town, where for as little as $3 per month, your contribution can help support the bedrock of this operation. That's patreon.com slash Bartholomew Town or click the support link wherever you're listening right now. Okay, without further ado, let's get to it. Of Rhode Island PBS weekly fame, Michelle San Miguel. All right, Michelle San Miguel, a legendary reporter in this market. Channel 10, of course, you know, the, uh, the big, the dime, I guess, for the inside baseball crowd. And now, most importantly, Rhode Island PBS weekly, which is you can watch it every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. on Rhode Island PBS. Also, Sundays at 7.30 p.m. on television. And then anytime at ripbs.org, you can stream it live, or you can also watch the episodes on demand after the fact. Welcome to the pod. Bill, I'm so excited to be here. You know, it's a shame that we have really got to know each other. We were just talking about this over Zoom because we were both hired. And then this show, we've been putting it on the air 
during the pandemic. So we really haven't gotten to know each other very much in person. So it's, it's exciting to be here. Yes, it's so true. And, you know, honestly, the it, it we were kind of talking about this before we started taping as well. It is a, a small miracle that this program has made it to the airwaves on a weekly basis, no pun intended. And the quality of the stories, the quality of the journalism, the quality of the photography, the editing, the whole production value is outstanding, even though a lot of times it's now via Zoom or whatever other pandemic restriction. I give a lot of credit to the photographers on this team because they have found a way to make it work editing remotely. I mean, and also the people that we're interviewing. I was interviewing someone the other day and we had just had a pretty decent snowfall in Rhode Island. And I am shoveling the backyard where we were doing the interview with my boots. Nice. And uh, he comes out or later and he goes, you know, I could have shoveled for you. And I said, I'm just grateful that you're willing to sit out here and it's 30 something degrees and we're sitting in the shade so that we could do these inter interviews. And as you know, these interviews with Rhode Island PBS Weekly are like hour, an hour long interview. These are not 10, 15 minute interviews. So I'm just grateful that people are willing to bundle up and sit outside and do this. Yeah, me too. And I think that it is a testament to what people want to, in terms of being able to tell their stories because, you know, you do a, a, a newspaper feature, obviously a TV feature on television news, a radio hit, you know, long form stuff like weekly, like this podcast. I think people want that now. They understand that they can do that. And so they're willing to sit outside on a park bench in 31 degree weather and deal with all the, on, the discomfort that comes with this moment to be able to pull off telling their own story. I completely agree. I think at the heart of it, people want their stories told. And when you start asking questions, you realize, gosh, it doesn't seem like people have asked these questions before. To, for example, you know, one of the things I love about Rhode Island PBS Weekly is that, yes, we get to do a combination of the hard news stories. These are the communities being hit hard by COVID. This is what's happening with the calls for racial justice. But we can also have opportunities to do more feature stories, talk with community organizers, talk with movers and shakers in Rhode Island. And for example, I recently interviewed Jim Vincent, the president of the oh, NAACP yeah. Providence branch. I'm always fascinated by how people came to be where they are and how mm -hmm. much their childhood shaped them and influenced them to get into the career that they have. And in talking with him, not that people hadn't asked him that, but I don't know that people from the media had asked him, hey, what was it about your childhood that prepared you to lead, especially in this moment, what we saw in 2020, you know, with the calls for racial justice? So that's one of the things that I really have loved about this show is that we're moving away from the short snippets, the short sound bites, and it's more of a conversation that's playing out. You know, I think like the art of the interview is much more on display because you are hearing more of that question and answer than you would be in other formats. And I hope, I mean, my hope is that when you watch some of these pieces, you leave feeling like, gosh, you know, that was something that I would have liked to have asked that person. I'm grateful the question was asked. And I got to know a part of that person that I otherwise would never have known, even though I've been seeing someone like Jim Vincent being interviewed on the news for years, but I never knew that about him before. And yeah. that's, that's, I hope the takeaway from the show. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I mean, I'm, I'm someone who, you know, I think about my favorite broadcasters on the national scale, you know, the first name that always comes to mind is Brian Gumbel, you know, mm -hmm. Brian Gumbel changed my life, you know, the, his, his ability to conduct an interview and, and even others, you know, that, that from that, I guess, nineties growing up, watching channel 10 and then sticking with the national, the, the long form with emotion. That's what, that's what Gumble brought to the table. It wasn't irrational emotion. It wasn't, uh, or isn't irrational emotion, but it's like, you don't have to have the dead eyes into the camera. Um, which frankly, a lot of the corporate news does present now. They, they this obsession with impartiality. Like if someone tells you something emotional, or even something interesting. Jim Vincent tells you, hey, I grew up in Boston. I came to Fox Point because the Cape Verdean community, whatever it is, 
Mm-hmm. That's interesting. You can react. You, your face can react. Your body language can react. Your, your, your soul is allowed to be exposed as an interviewer. You have done a great job with that. And that's what keeps the, the, the conversation natural. It's not just like, where did you grow up? Why are you here? You know, <laughs> it's, it's very a real, mechanical. Yeah. Very mechanical. And it's, and it's a beautiful, it is 100% an art. Um, just the same as painting or music or anything like that. It, to me, it comes much more from an artistic angle than from a humanities element, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. I often tell interns when I was working at Channel 10 and previously at other stations, before anything else, you are a human being, right? Like before you put on that journalism cap and you know we all wear multiple hats right throughout the day, you're a human. And so whether that means that you're knocking on someone's door who just lost a loved one, which I mean, frankly, every reporter has had to do, right? Yes, you're approaching it as a journalist, but more than anything, you're approaching it as a human being. And I often think if God forbid I was in that situation, how would I want someone to approach me? Recognizing that that person has every right to slam the door on your face, which has happened to, you know, say expletives at you. But more often than not, Bill, I find that people want their story to be told. And even if they don't, I think that they're grateful and understanding of the fact that you have a job to do. And so I think, you know, it's really easy in this industry um, to lose yourself because there is a deadline. And, you know, I often tell people it's one of the few jobs where you're not counting down the clock because you don't want it to be five o'clock because your story airs at five, you know? So it's really easy to get lost in the shuffle of the daily grind, but we can't forget that we are talking with other human beings. And as journalists, we're often meeting people at two extremes on some of the best days of their lives, right? They were just given an award. They just got out of the hospital and they're getting to ride home in a fire truck, you know, I mean, and those are some (laughs) really cool moments. And then you're also meeting people on some of the worst days of their lives. They've been accused of a crime. They just lost a loved one in a horrific way. Um, So yeah, you can't lose the humanity in it. I mean, if you are, then it's time to move on, I think. I think so too. And I think that goes for viewers as well. People have choices now, you know, and I think people are making choices to say, look, I want more human oriented content. You know, I want a, a person that I can relate to, to share my stories. And frankly, I think one thing that we need more of in this market and in general is people from different communities telling those stories, you know, the, you know, sort of the, the, the preppy looking white male puts on the red tie dead stare into the camera is so passe at this point that um, I don't even know if people realize it that are in, involved in the business, but you see it fading. You see people turning away from that and turning to new media, long form journalism, whatever it may be. And, you do a great job because you bring a lot of different experiences to the table. I guess let's go through like, where did you grow up? Who are you? Who's Michelle San Miguel? Let's go. Who is Michelle San Miguel? I'm still figuring that out, Bill. No. Well, we all are getting us a terrible. (laughs) I was born in Miami. I am from a Cuban American family. So my father was born in Cuba. All of my grandparents were born in Cuba and that played a big role in my life. I mean, I remember growing up in Miami watching the Elian Gonzalez saga play out when I was a young girl. And I knew from a pretty early age that I wanted to get into journalism. So I went to an all girls Catholic high school, which I loved. And when I was there, I was the editor in chief of my high school newspaper. Nice. I loved it. I was bitten by the news bug from a young age. And I was also growing up in a city where, I mean, you can't believe the things that happen in Miami, you know, much less Florida, right? There's like a hashtag (laughs) only in Florida. Yeah, And so I remember my guidance counselor approaching me about considering going to Syracuse. And I said, oh, I don't know if I want to be in New York. And because in my mind, New York was New York City. Like I didn't really have a concept of what Syracuse, New York was as, you know, a girl from Miami, Florida. A little bit different. I went up, a little bit different, right? I went up to Syracuse, fell in love with it, um, went on to get my broadcast journalism, international relations degree there. And then from there, I applied, as so many people in this situation can relate to, like over 100 stations. And, you know, some of the offers that were coming in were um, exciting, but, you know, I was just like, 
how do you live off nineteen thousand dollars a year? Mm-hmm. I remember talking to one news director. I, I didn't take this job at the time, and he said, "Well, you know, um, we find that a lot of the journalists, their parents help them out." And I thought, "Well, I mean, that's great, but part of being on your own is being on your own financially." So. Anyway, fast forward, I ended up getting my first um, job in Bismarck, North Dakota. Oh, very nice. And I can still remember my dad pulled out a map and he goes, well, let's see where this Bismarck, North Dakota is. You know, where exactly is Bismarck within the state? And that was my first job. And I loved it. I was there for almost two years. And my first day on the job, my news director calls me into her office and she says, Michelle, so how do you feel about being the energy reporter energy like 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 can, energy can, like actual gas and wind farms yeah. and things like oh okay yeah and so my 22 year old self was like thinking what do i know about energy and so the first thing that came to mind was like the law of conservation of energy and i was you know at the time <laughs> i knew like there was this big oil boom happening but the oil boom wasn't within bismarck it was in the western part of the state mm-hmm. so i was a little bit surprised But, you know, there were a lot of things happening within the city, you know, colleges and universities were expanding their oil programs, companies were setting up hubs within Bismarck. So as I got to learn more about the market, it made sense. So I ended up being there for two years, loved it, then moved to Southern Colorado to work in Pueblo for three years in the Pueblo, Colorado Springs market, which was really interesting because when I was there recreational marijuana stores were just opening up and it was up to each municipality to decide whether they wanted to open the stores. Right. So the County that I lived in was one of the first two counties in the state to open them. So I did a lot of stories about the legalization and the industry. Mm -hmm. And then from there moved to Rhode Island in early 2016. So I've been here for five years now. That's so interesting. I love the North Dakota stuff. You know, there's, there's the market that comes up a lot of times i think it's alpina Is yes the name? it's it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. The, the the lowest rated or the smallest market smallest in, market and it's like it's like one of those like um fast food restaurants you see sometimes where it's like pizza hut kentucky fried chicken taco bell all it's <laughs> it's like fox cbs and nbc in the middle of nowhere Lindsay ida luca and Lindsay delucia both came through That's that right. market and i'll actually go to that website you know, their version of turn to 10.com on occasion and think about like, wow, what an interest. Like, I wonder what, like, if I had made the call earlier to say, to say, I want to go broadcasting. If I had ended up in those situations, what would my life have been like? Would I have stuck with it? Would I have? And so I give you all a lot of credit because you're in these smaller markets in the middle of the country and experiencing this from, I don't know, like just a, a just a, challenging perspective, you know, on a low salary. That's, that's really amazing. But can I just say about small markets? Because I think oftentimes people like roll their eyes when, especially when I've talked to interns in the past, well, you know, I, I'll hear, I'll hear people say, I'd love to start in a place like Providence. And mm-hmm. it's like, well, you know, I get that, but you're going to make so many mistakes when you start out. I mean, you will always be making mistakes, right? We're all a work in progress but you will make so many mistakes. The nerves will be kicking in. You don't want to do that in a market like this. You want to do this in a market that's a small market where people are by and large more understanding of the fact that you're coming straight out of college, right? We all have to learn somewhere. But I think, Bill, it's so important, especially as a journalist, that you get out of your comfort zone because so many of the stories that we have to take on frankly, should make you uncomfortable. It should make you uncomfortable to knock on someone's door. It should make you uncomfortable um, on a regular basis that you're covering things that you really don't know much about, right? And I think that for me, it helped me to go somewhere that I probably otherwise would have never gone before because I got to just experience life um, and just see how differently people within our country live. And so I'm grateful. I think it made me a more interesting, more well-rounded person. And I think that's part of what you do as a journalist. Like it's, if you're too comfortable for too long, I think it's time to shake things up. I definitely agree with that, especially in Rhode Island. You know, I, I think that there's a, there's a value to being here your whole life and and all that, no question. But at the same time, you know, I, I think that there are people who get so, comfortable here in Rhode Island that they, they don't have a real 
ability to have empathy for people. And it's, it's in a, a lot of different ways. You know, some people will mock, oh, that, you know, these idiots in the middle of the country or uh, toothless fools or whatever, or the, you know, they, they take it in a, in the context of like, oh, the city's dangerous or something like that. And talking mm-hmm. about New York or whatever. And it's like, boy, you know, if you have even a year in your life where you can leave and then come back, you're going to feel so much different, so differently about your experience here in Southern New England. And I think it makes you a more interesting person for sure. And I think too, when you return home, like, you know, home for me will always be Miami. When I go back home to visit my family, because most of my family is still there, I have a newfound appreciation for it because I have lived in so many other places. So I, you know, I always encourage people, if you can go away, whether it's for college or if you pursue a career like journalism or whatever industry that you choose, and if it allows you the ability to go somewhere else for a year or two, why not? I mean, it's like, we live in such a fascinating place. Um, Why not just go see how differently other people live? Yeah, definitely. Couldn't agree more with that. So Rhode Island though, and Southern New England, I mean, technically that's the market. Do you like, do you love it here? I mean, I know you live in mass. Do you feel embraced by the community and and all that? Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. I love it here. So we moved here five years ago. My husband got a job in the Boston market. So my husband and I met at Syracuse. We both work in television. So when he got the job over here, I was still in Colorado at the time. And so moved out here without a job. I always say on love and a prayer. (laughs) So I moved out here. (laughs) And shortly thereafter, I was hired at Channel 10. I do love it. I think one of the things I love about Rhode Island is that within less than an hour, you have the urban core, you have the suburbs, you have the coastal communities, you have rural areas. I mean, everything that you can find here, I'm telling people, leave, leave your comfort zone. But when you think about it, you can find so many different ways of life, even within Rhode Island. Plus I'm an ocean girl. I mean, I grew up in Miami and so Rhode Island is not that different. Yes. It's a lot colder, but I've lived in, you know, colder places. So yeah, I, I love this state. I mean, there's so, there's so much news. I, when I moved here, so yeah, five years ago, I knew there was, you know, a pretty significant Hispanic population and I was hoping to tap into that, but I was like, oh, I don't know how much I'll be able to use my Spanish. And I have been blown away by how much I've been able to use it. And that has made me fall in love with Rhode Island even more because that's such a big part of who I am is being bilingual, growing up in, you know, a Hispanic family. So I have just embraced the state. I feel very much, you know, like people have embraced me. Um, it's funny because I feel like at times people get disappointed that I'm not Portuguese when they hear, oh, San Miguel. Yeah, exactly. You're right. <laughs> and so I've had to break a few hearts and say, no, I'm sorry. I'm not Portuguese, but if you want me to be sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whatever you want. Just, just let's go here. Yeah, no, I agree. Rhode Island's magical. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it does have, and, and there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of opportunity for a major change here that would be mm-hmm. extremely beneficial as well. And I think it's one of those things where patience has to be at play as, as frankly, younger people get more and more into positions of power and influence on boards of directors inside the general assembly, inside the media and, mm-hmm all of that. And as that happens, I feel like Rhode Island can turn this, the, the, the negative aspects of the state can easily be removed with just a few tweaks over the next decade or so. Um, and, and I hope that that happens because it's, it is the type of place where you go, wow, this is a, everything kind of wrapped into one small fa- area. Almost, I almost said facility, like <laughs> it pretty much yeah. is a facility. A tr- like a, the the pen of Rhode Island. But look at just this past year, right? We have the most diverse general assembly yep. in state history. And I, I mean, as our, as journalists, right. And our role as journalists, I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we're interviewing people who reflect the state so that if you're not seeing it, if you're not seeing diversity in your neighborhood and your bubble, at least when you turn on the television, you're seeing that because yeah. we're not making it up. It exists. And I'm, that's something that I'm so adamant about is, you know, we should be talking with people who don't just look and sound like us. Definitely. I couldn't agree more. It's a responsibility. And in fact, it's an ethical responsibility that I think 
other operations, and I won't say their names because there's and look, there's look, there's a lot of people I respect in these operations, but for whatever reason, they don't do a good job of telling the whole story. Now, someone who is a longtime news person in this market told me one time, "Hey, look, our job um, is to reach over fifty suburban and w- white people. That's how we're selling yeah. television. Uh, that's how we're selling car commercials. That's how we're selling and." Uh, life insurance commercials. That's our job that we're getting paid for. Now, our life calling is to tell everybody's story. Unfortunately, I have a job that I've got to serve this this purpose of selling used cars and, and cars to people in the suburbs. So that's where I think Rhode Island PBS Weekly comes in and where I've tried to fill that void in terms of of the the, the talk radio aspect of things with this show is, mm-hmm. well, wait a second. I don't have, I'm not selling at any commercials. Rhode Island PBS, we don't have any, we're not pushing That's any right. auto dealerships. We're, we're not pushing any of that nonsense. So this show, Rhode Island PBS Weekly, it can freely, without having to hear from somebody in like, some corporate headquarters in Atlanta or whatever, say, hold on a second, you know, you're not, you're, our demo numbers are off. We're not, um, you know, Paul Bailey's not happy with your performance here. It's, it's such a unique opportunity to embrace. And I don't know if there's ever been a a more important time to do that, right? We have a global pandemic that has unfortunately become politicized where the disparities that existed long before COVID have further come to light. So if you weren't paying attention before, right, we've seen that communities like Central Falls that has had the highest infection rate throughout this, right, has been disproportionately affected. Mm -hmm. Um, The calls, like I mentioned before, for racial justice. So, you know, we should never have been ignoring marginalized communities, but even more so as a journalist, I feel a responsibility to make sure that we're telling those stories and that they're more than just 30 second sound bites. You know, right. that we have the opportunity for these stories to play out. And like I was saying before, too, to hear that exchange, to hear what questions are Michelle and Bill asking these folks, you know, and to hear that response, I think is so important because sometimes. When you're just hearing that little snippet, you don't necessarily know the question that preceded it. Um, so, uh, you know, it's an important time to be doing this work. It's a challenging time, too, because the ways that we would naturally go about meeting people, right, and meeting up to get to know someone, unfortunately, we're having to do, as you and I do all the time, right? We're, we're talking on Zoom every week, you know, and we're cold calling people. And, of course, cold calling people is a natural part of the job. But so is saying, hey, I'd love to swing by your office and talk to you. You know, there's none of that right now. And so it, yeah. it's so much more important to make sure you're setting a good tone when you make that initial call because first impressions are everything. And unfortunately, with COVID, I don't know when we're going to get to see people face to face again. I know. I couldn't agree more. All right, folks, this is getting real. The time for talk is over. From iron workers to engineers, business owners to biology teachers, Rhode Islanders believe in the power of offshore wind. Together, we're cleaning the air and creating jobs right here at home. Our goal of 100% renewables by 2030 is in sight, and the future is bright with Rhode Island a real leader in America's emerging offshore wind industry. So what makes you a Revolution Wind believer? Join us at revolution-wind.com slash it's real. That's revolution-wind.com slash it's real. Let's go. You know, sometimes people, they ask like, how did, how did I get the Rolodex that I've, that I've kind of built or the, the frankly, some, some cases like friends over the last couple of years. And it's like before COVID, I was at the state house like every day or I was at, at, at rallies or events or whatever, like multiple to every day I was out and you know, you start to, at first I would literally just be going into the state house with no destination and just standing there and like, okay, what do I do? All right. Well, I know Dan McKee and his people, maybe I'll stop there and say hi. And then all of a sudden you pass somebody who works for Matt Yellow and they get an introduction there. And then you see him three months later and people don't realize how you construct these things. It's not just the cold, the cold call. It's so many 
months or years of persistence. And I've only been doing this for, for two, well, I guess three years now, but the first two years were literally hours and hours and hours and hours of just hanging around at events, not knowing a single person, people like, who is this guy, you know, and just interacting with people. And that's the job. And that's something that very few people are able to do today because of COVID. And Absolutely. I feel super lucky that, and I'm sure you feel the same way that mm -hmm. because as we're doing these stories for TV, you know, you can call a Peter Narona or a mm -hmm. Providence police chief or what, you know, a, a community activist or whoever it is because of those pre-existing relationships. I don't know that I could do that today if I was starting now without having built those relationships just by calling up and saying, hi, uh, I'm from uh, Rhode Island PBS. Can you talk to us for an hour in the cold? Oh, absolutely. No, I think having the fact that I've already worked in this market for four years, you know, at Channel 10 has made a big difference. If I was just starting out in this market during COVID, I mean, like you said, I don't know how, how I would be getting certain people to talk to me yeah. because it's like, who are you, you know, and, and explaining you know, you not only be a new person to the market, but you're also a new show, even though people are familiar with Rhode Island PBS. It's funny. I had a, a news director when he would see too many reporters in the newsroom, he would say, what are you guys doing here? There's no news in the newsroom. Get out, get out. You know? Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, it was a little bit annoying to hear it because at the time you're making calls, but I understood where this person was coming from. Like, you're right. There is no news here. Like get out. And that goes back to what I was saying before. Like, you're going to feel uncomfortable. You're being put in situations where, you know, you don't know anybody. And let's be honest, the reporter is not the most well-liked person in the room as it should be. And so you have to just get comfortable with the fact that there will be people who don't like you. And if yeah. everybody likes you, you're probably not doing your job. Yeah. You know, your job is not to be the most liked person. I, I often joke, you know, I have enough friends. I don't need any more friends. Obviously, who doesn't want more friends? But you shouldn't be looking at subjects who you're interviewing um, as a potential friend. I mean, these are people that we're interviewing for stories. And yeah, I just, I like to be out and about. And, yes. and I'm excited for the day because the day will come, hopefully this summer, that we can be out and about, you know, safely, whatever that looks like in a pre-pan or a post-pandemic world. Um to get to see people again. Yeah, it does seem like we're trending in the right direction anyway. And look, the, the vaccine rollout here in Rhode Island was not acceptable at the beginning. It, they they have done a better job and it will be interesting to see what a Governor McKee plan looks like. You know, um, we're in a weird situation right now as we're taping. Governor Raimondo is still the governor. Mm -hmm. And Dan McKee said last Friday, I'm just an incoming governor. I'm not a governor. There's a big difference. He's totally right. So things mm -hmm. are in flux, but I feel like I asked yesterday, Dr. Chan at the Department of Health, how much does all of this, you know, the big stories that they're running on the six o'clock news about this, this chaos in terms of leadership, how much is that really affecting your ability to get the vaccine out? And they said, well, it's not optimal, but not really affecting it at all. We'll be, mm -hmm. and he was like, by the time summer rolls around, you know, he's 42, I'm 36. Um, mm -hmm. You're what, 21, 22? Is that? <laughs> 33. <laughs> but, you know, so our general age group, he said, yeah, by June, July, just relax. We'll be fine. We'll be out there. We'll be back to mingling and and not like nut cases, but maybe sometimes masked. But we're on the way to get back to that. And so it's like, if we can just hold on a little bit longer, we'll be able to deliver in this, in the near future. I know it's hard to be patient because yeah. we all feel like we've been patient enough for almost a year now, but you know, I think for a lot of people, the most difficult thing that they had been asked to do this year is to stay home. Yep. You know, you're not having people being asked to go to war. People are not being drafted. I don't want to take away from the seriousness of the fact that I know that there are many people, right? We just reached the half million milestone, sadly, in this country for fatalities. And we know the mental health toll that this has taken. Um, but for a lot of other people, right, it's a matter of staying home and not mingling with others, you know, with too many households outside of their own. And so I think it's, you know, try to be patient. You know, you hear stories about people trying to cut the line and people in Florida dressing up like the elderly. And, you know, that's where I just say, you know, what, you know, 
what in the world? We just, um, we can't lose our humanity in this. We just no. can't. No, we can't. It's, it's, it's wacky. It, when, when I was filling in on the radio right before Christmas, we were kind of in the thick of people being fed up with staying at home. And this guy called up and he was like, imagine if during the bombing of London, you know, when in World War II, when people were instructed, hey, keep your lights off at night so as to thwart or at least it, it do the best you can to thwart Nazi planes from dropping bombs on the city. Imagine if a bunch of people just said, no, nah, I'm entitled to electricity. I'm, I'm entitled to my lights and I'm going to turn it on. It's the same exact thing that's happening with these fools that are mm-hmm. out there promoting conspiracy theories, f- refusing to wear a mask, saying they're not going to you know, adhere to the, the basic guidelines. Look, I get it. There are, there are things that uh, it comes down to common sense. At the beginning, I was basically wearing a poncho, an N95 mask, gloves, <laughs> goggles. If I went to the supermarket and I'd still have an actual medical panic attack in the store. Like I was that freaked out by this. And okay, now I'm at a point where I'll have a fire with my friends and we won't wear masks, but we're spread out. We're outdoors. Nobody's sick. No one's getting sick. I get it. So there are extremes yeah. like, but at the same time, it is sad. And from a journalist's viewpoint to watch humanity play itself out and to have these camps of people that are saying, nope, the virus is fake, or I'm not going to do anything to help the cause that mm-hmm. that's shocking. And that going forward, that changes the periscope with, with which we will look at telling Rhode Island stories, knowing that there are a lot of people in the state that genuinely thought this was a hoax and genuinely um, and still do and, and still, still do. do and people who won't get I mean I was just talking with someone the other day who was like I'm not going to get vaccinated and I said why not well because we don't know how long this vaccine protects us and I said well yeah we don't know but like that's but would you rather they lie to you and say that we know it protects us for x amount when we don't know and I said if if there aren't enough people who get vaccinated then we're going to be in this situation indefinitely we need to reach right. herd immunity and so it's it's a really look i don't envy the work of public health officials of scientists right now because i don't know how you persuade people who are so convinced that this is a hoax or it's not as dire as people have made it out to be to get the vaccine and i'm hopeful that enough people have taken this seriously that we'll be able to reach herd immunity God willing, sometime later this year. But you sort of, I mean, you go a little crazy when you hear people saying, I'm not going to get vaccinated. You know, I said, well, <laughs> then I don't want you around my child. Yeah, seriously. You like, know? let's go. I mean, come on. You know, I, I, that's shocking to me. And, and I, I don't know, I, I just don't even know where to begin with that. That if you, if you, I get it. Like, let's say you don't trust the media. You don't trust politicians. You might not even, you might've had a bad experience and not trust education you know, whatever it may be, but to turn your back on science and medicine, Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, like, who do you trust then? I mean, do you have any faith in humanity? If you're willing to say, no, these people are lying to me. That is shocking. Um, And even the distrust in the media, right? Because we get put into this big category. I have never built, and I've been doing this for 11 years. So not a lifetime, but you know, long enough where I have never had somebody tell me, Michelle, I need you to take, tell this story through this political lens. I mean, one thing is to tell a reporter, I want you to approach this story through this angle specifically, you know, for example, tell a COVID story through the lens of how it's affected a certain community, but never, I want you to tell it with this political undertone. And so like we can't forget that the media, right, as we all refer to it, are the same people who shop in our grocery stores, people we went to school with. Like this is not some entity that's out there that doesn't exist in our community. These are local reporters telling these stories. And so yeah. it's like that just boggles me when I hear when I hear that. I know. And it's I feel terribly for um people at Channel 10, you know, that have that that have to deal with this Sinclair nonsense. Which, you know, look, I mean, Sinclair is is a right wing company and it makes me uncomfortable. And then a lot of the things that they promote, I go, boy, that's that's scary. But that has absolutely no impact on the storytelling of Mario Hilario, of Lindsay 
uh, Delucia, that of, of anybody in that newsroom. Now, Val Sente, he may go off and make a couple of comments that people go, wait a second, what are you talking about, man? But that's his thing. That's who he is. And that's not Sinclair telling him to do that. That's Gene being Gene. You love it. You hate it. You don't care, whatever it is. And people have this weird perception, same with WPRO, that like somehow Cumulus Media like shows up every morning with an agenda. And all that is is just people seeing a red light go on and ranting for three hours from their heart. Um, and and I don't know why that that so many people believe that the corporations are dictating what is actually being told on the news because it's not true. I think sometimes for viewers, it can be hard. This is just my impression to yeah. distinguish between when something is an editorial and when something is not, even though to me, it's pretty obvious. Right. But I think that we could all just be better about labeling editorials as editorials so that when you hear the general manager of a TV station or somebody who you know is a right wing or left wing commentator come on, that this person is not representing the views of that outlet. I think we could all just be better about that, right? Like when you open up the newspaper, there's no mistaking the fact that you're reading the opinion section. And so there you will see the columns, letters to the editor. I just think with television, we could probably all just be better with that. I completely For example, agree. with Rhode Island PBS Weekly, right? Like we're now introducing a commentary on X, Y, and Z, right? And so you won't find... Like, I won't be giving a commentary because as a journalist, that's just not my role. I don't feel like people care <laughs> or you know, care about what I think I about think they something. Care, but yeah, I know well, what you maybe mean. they do, but but I wouldn't I wouldn't come on and give a commentary. Yeah. It's just not my role. Yep. I completely agree. It's not in the same sector. It's it's totally not not the right thing to do. Just like it's Scott McKay shouldn't come on and do a report on something and then give a commentary 15 minutes later. So right. Um, last area I want to get to here, someone who's important to you, important to me that we lost recently, Bill Rapoli. Bill Rapoli, you know, I always say the guy jumped out of the television screen. I remember when he showed up on Channel 10 because um, I never watched anything but 10 when I was growing up. I know he was on 6 and all this and that and the other. But I was like, who is this guy? You know, uh, what a cadence, what a what a persona, wearing the hat. You know, I just became so excited about Bill Rapoli as a kid, fast forward 15, 20 years, whatever it was, 15 years later, and he was sitting here in my studio and we were doing a podcast that he literally didn't leave for like three hours after we finished taping. And at that moment, I realized, wow, I have a friend here that's like, I'm going to see him out and about at press conferences and we're going to tell jokes and he's going to give me a, a pointer here or there. To think that I had the opportunity to work alongside this guy, even for the short window that I did, uh, it's a dream come true. And to lose him still hurts every day when I think about the fact that what Rhode Islanders have lost by not having this incredible personality as a part of their day-to-day -day lives. I feel the same way, Bill. He was such a huge presence in Rhode Island. He was the father of five girls. And I yeah. think about that often, like there are five young women out there who I can't imagine what this time has been like for them. I'm so grateful to him. He was the one bill. I was on maternity leave and he contacted me early last year and said, Hey, Michelle, you know, I remember you mentioning that you were interested in long form reporting and you know those conversations that you have with people that like you're just surprised that they remember because it yep. just seemed like a brief moment in time. And so when he called me to tell me, you know, Rhode Island PBS is launching this show, I was like struck by the fact that he even remembered that conversation. And so at any point, he was the one who told me to apply for this job, who recommended that I apply. And I had a similar experience where I remember a conversation that we had early on when I started here. We were on the phone for a few hours and I just thought he's spending this much time talking to me to make me feel comfortable with, you know, because it's so different from what I had been doing before, but he wanted to spend the time to make sure that I was comfortable with what we were doing and, and telling long form stories. One of our friends, um, Lori Solinger, who works at Channel 10, described Bill for the, we did a, as you know, a tribute show. 
for Bill in Rhode Island PBS. And I loved what she said. She said, he was the smartest person in the room yeah. and never let you know it. Exactly. And I just thought that was Bill. I mean, I can remember so many times needing a phone number of a politician, you know, a cell phone number or Bill, can you give me like a one minute breakdown of what this bill means? And you never felt silly approaching him, no matter how foolish the question might have been. He never made you feel that way, even though he knew so much about it. He was just always a relatable, helpful guy. And when he called me last year to tell me he was sick, in that same conversation that he acknowledged that he had a cancer and the prognosis was not looking good, he began giving me unsolicited advice about life, about marriage, about relationships. And I just thought, here you are telling me like the most devastating news and you're giving me unsolicited life advice, you know, Bill, and that's just, that's who he was, you know, and I saw him just a few weeks before he passed away. He was still committed to doing stories. Yep. He was still committed to taping the show, even though he knew that he was sick. And I don't know, you know, I don't know what he thought as far as how much time he had, but that he felt that the work that he was doing was that important, I think is just a testament. Um, and just one last thing I want to say about Bill is that when I think about his final months, I feel like we all learned so much about how we all know we're going to die. Right. And it's like not a conversation that most yeah. of us have on a regular basis talking about our mortality. And yet I feel like in his final months, he taught so many of us a lot about grace and how to approach those last moments of your life in such a classy way. Um, and he said to me, you know, Michelle, I'm, I'm now able, not now, but I'm having conversations with people that I probably otherwise wouldn't have because he knew um, that, you know, that unfortunately the prognosis wasn't good. So I, I think about him often. I think about his daughters often. May he rest in peace. I will forever be grateful for his friendship, for everything he taught me. Yeah, no question about it. One of the all-time greats, you know, one yeah, of the all-time greats and, and uh, just hoping to keep his legacy alive as, as long as possible as well as something that especially after COVID. I'm not sure. I'm sure there'll be a lot of scholarships and awards and things like that in his name. But, you know, I was out in a snowstorm, um, one of the recent snowstorms and I should have, I don't know why I didn't post this, but, um, you know, I, I film myself. I just turned on the camera. I was like, all right, welcome to, this is the first annual Bill Rapoli snow angel challenge. My name is Bill Bartholomew <laughs> just did a snow angel. And I was like, I, I challenged like Ian Donis and Lindsay Ida Luca to, uh, to yeah. So the next snowstorm that's going up online. Look there out. you go. There you go. <laughs> and during the summertime, rock a fedora. In honor oh of yeah. Bill Rapley, you well, know? you know, he, he had said one, he had called me one time because they hadn't, we, we had this discussion where they weren't giving me a clothing allowance at uh, mm -hmm. Everett Allen PBS or whatever. So, so yeah. he called me up and he's like, look, you know, I think I, I, you're, what size are you? And I was like, I, I, you know, 42, you know, flex, pants depending on how much time I'm willing to put into working out in that particular <laughs> month. But, but it was like, well, look, I, you know, I probably have about 50 suits that you can have. I just feel uncomfortable giving them to you because ah, they're, they're, they're just not hipster. You know, they're just not cut <laughs> the pants. They, 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 they're just not Bill Bartholomew, you know, but if you're desperate, you know, come on by and I'll give you like, you know, I'll give you like 50 suits. I love that. It's amazing. Yeah. So you went by and you got them. I never did. I never did. Okay. I never did. But uh, you know I wonder if you reach out to his daughters. I'm sure if you tell them that story, you know, but that just shows that's how Bill was. I mean, it. I remember yep. one time, like I was looking for a parent to interview for a story about Providence schools, could not find anyone. And it's one of those moments where you're like, oh, please, God, you're praying. Let me find a parent. And you're doing what they call man on the street, woman on the street, trying to find people. Yeah. I call Bill. And Bill helped me find somebody, but he yeah. was just that guy. Like no matter how busy he was, Hey, you need something. Yeah, I can help you. You know, even if that meant the photographer now had 20 minutes to cut the story instead of 25, yeah. like he was willing to help you out. The photographer may have been frustrated, but the story got done. He helped his coworker. That's how Bill was. Yeah. Unbelievable human being. And, um, Hey, Rhode Island PBS weekly, you know, 
the idea is to to take that thing all the way to the top and that he would want nothing less than that. And what the top means, I don't know. I don't think it's a ratings thing. It's just you know it when you see it. And um, I think I think the show is is amazing. You're doing an amazing job anchoring, producing stories, providing heart and soul into it, which I think is the most critical thing that this type of show needs that that makes it stand out. And everybody should tune in if you if you want on Wednesday night at seven o'clock. If not, then ripbs.org slash weekly and you'll find the digital pieces there. You can go through the archive. There's tons of great stuff up there. You've had some amazing stories. COVID, Central Falls. Um, it always jumps out to me. I've shared that piece with a lot of people that are, th- th- sometimes I'll see a comment like, why is Central Falls getting the vaccine before me? I'm an, et- whatever I work, you know, I'm 25 and I work in a restaurant on, and I'll send them <laughs> just, here it is. Just watch this yep. Thank and you. relax. Yeah. And that's, that's the tool that you're, you're, that, that, that I, that this, this show is able to produce. I almost forget that I'm involved in it, even though I shouldn't because it consumes so much of my life. You're doing a great job, Bill. <laughs> I'm honored that we have this platform to tell these stories, yeah. especially during this time. I'm looking forward to seeing where the show goes. I mean, there's, where else can we do a long form story on a young girl who has a company where she makes soap from goat milk yes. <laughs> and then, and then pivot and do a feature on judge Caprio yeah. and then do a story about, you know, women leaving the workforce in droves doing a story about the Jamal Gonzalez investigation. I yeah. mean, we're able to do such a variety of stories and we have the platform to tell those stories anywhere between seven, 13 minutes. So I'm excited. Yeah. It's going to grow. So all right, Michelle San Miguel, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Rhode Island PBS Weekly. It is the new thing in town. You may have seen the billboards as you were driving around. If you didn't, then imagine billboards with, they, they should have put your face on the billboard. That was my no. one criticism. I was like, they should, it should be you like cross-armed, smiling, like with the, you know, with like the reading rainbow font behind you. No, no, I'm perfectly fine not being on the billboard. (laughs) My face does not need to be that big. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hear that. Rhode Island's podcast of record, B-Town. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com slash employers.